it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to our Innovation Hall of Fame panel discussion. It is a first of many events on a very busy weekend, all dedicated to innovation, and we are proud and excited for this special day, as well as tomorrow. Before I begin, I uh, will always like to start and acknowledge our American Sign Language interpreters who provide access to all of our programming here at RIT for our deaf and hard of hearing community here. They play a dual role, actually, in today's panel discussion because not only do they provide a function, but they also are symbolic for our commitment to universal access, which will be a topic within today's discussion. Next, I'd like to introduce our very distinguished panel of uh, inventors and innovators and designers. I'm going to start with uh, Patty Moore, right here to my immediate uh, left. Uh, and Patty Moore, if you don't know her, is an internationally renowned gerontologist and designer serving as a leading authority on consumer lifespan behaviors and requirements. She's quite notable for a period of three years from 1979 to 1982 in an exceptional and daring experiment. She traveled throughout the United States and Canada disguised as women more than 80 years of age and with her body altered to simulate the normal sensory changes associated with aging, she was able to respond to people, products, and environments as an elder. Her broad range of experiences include communication design, research, product development and design, environmental design, package design, you get a theme there, transportation design, market analysis, and product positioning. We're very proud of Patty Moore because she holds an undergraduate degree in industrial and environmental and communication design from Rochester Institute of Technology. And she was distinguished as the alumni of the year in 1984. She also holds though advanced uh, degrees in, from the advanced studies in biomechanics at New York University's medical school and Rusk in, uh, Institute graduate degrees in psychology and counseling and in human development. So Patty, we're pleased to have you with us. Thank you very much. <laughs> to Patty's left is a distinguished gentleman by the name of Dean Kamen. Dean Kamen is the founder and president of DECA Research and Development Corporation. Many of you probably know uh, Mr. Kamen's vast contributions for the Segway human transporter, but you may not know that other examples of the technologies de developed by Dean and DECA include the Home Choice portable dialysis machine, the iBot mobility system, a DARPA funded robo robotic arm, a new and improved Sterling engine, and the Slingshot water purifier. He is uh, the recipient of numerous awards, which we will highlight in tonight's Innovation Hall of Fame ceremony. But he w I want to particularly draw out the fact that he was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame in 2005 and is a, m a member of the National Academy of Engineering since 1997. Among his proudest accomplishments is the founding of FIRST, which stands for, for Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. It's an organization dedicated to motivating the next generation to understand, use, and enjoy science and technology. And we are proud sponsors of FIRST here at RIT. Dean, thank you for joining us. And by the way, Dean has a connection to us for he holds an honorary doctorate degree from RIT. Finally, our good friend Kevin Serace. He's an alum uh, of our College of Applied Science and Technology in the Electrical Engineering Technology Program in 1985. Kevin is chair of the, uh, chairman of the board of Serious Materials, and he has been innovating in a number of technology fields since graduating from RIT 
For the last nine years, he has developed and patented a number of disruptive technologies that reduce energy usage in buildings, the world's largest contributor of CO2. Kevin has brought high-tech materials, products, and services to 70,000 projects, including iconic structures such as the Empire State Building and the New York Stock Exchange. He's a well-known speaker and advocate for sustainability, energy efficiency, jobs, disruptive innovation, and entrepreneurship. For near, prior to joining Serious Materials, Kevin served as CEO and president of Perfect Commerce and earlier, uh, and an earlier executive vice president of products and network services of General Magic, where he built the world's largest internet telephone operations center, serving millions of users, including web and voice services. So Kevin, thank you for joining us today. Well, the theme for today's panel discussion focuses on the interplay between design and innovation. And in, of course, in honor of this theme, I, I, I chose to wear the standard uniform of any good designer, which is a black suit, so um, in honor of that. And I also wore my Lego watch, so we've got both themes going on here as well. But it is a theme that is right and fitting to do at RIT. Why? Because RIT is a technical institute, of course, where we have gearheads and computer jockeys, we have makers and builders, and people who unmake and unbuild so that they learn how systems work. But unlike our uh, other institute of technology over there in the Boston area, we've got real designers and artists at, in our arsenal. So the work we do today will actually inform us of how we can leverage our unique assets here at RIT. How can we mix, as President Dester likes to say, the geeks with the artists and really generate a unique brand and niche for RIT? I will uh, occasionally throw out perhaps some quotes from Steve Jobs uh, maybe he's a little overquoted right now. Uh, maybe we should just let him rest in peace. But uh, on the other hand, he has some good things to say. So one I liked is, design is not just what it looks like and feels like. Design is how it works. So let's get started. Our first topic that I'm going to throw out to the panel, and by the way, we're going to have a few topics to kind of get the discussion flowing. It's a conversation, as you can kind of see, not a real panel discussion. Um, but after a few topics, uh, I understand that we're going to have some text messages and, and other questions brought forward from our audience so that you'll be able to get engaged with our panelists as well. So be thinking of what you would like to ask our distinguished guests here. So we're going to open it up with just kind of a broad hand grenade into the area of design and innovations in the most general sense. So. Panelists, I'm going to turn to you. I want to see who will want to d j dive right into this. The question is, when you think of design and innovation, what are the first things that come to your mind? What, what, are, your, what are your philosophies or what's your approach to design and innovation? Who would like to go first? <laughs> Good call, dude. When someone tells me something can't be done, I know I'm on the right track. When someone tells me we can't afford to do it, we definitely know we're on the right track. And I learned this lesson here at RIT in, in studio work. I wasn't happy with an assignment that we were given, and I asked if I could come up with my own assignment. And what I chose was to go into the inner city and work in a public school that was really not doing well. I don't have any money. <laughs> We're not getting uh, sound here. If you, Tyler, if you could come down and help us out. So we went into um, a school that deliberately uh, needed help. 
And by that point, I had um, strong-armed a couple of my fellow students. Um, you have to remember, when, when I was here, it was the, we were the first graduating class of the new campus. And I think there were seven of us in our class. And we had three professors. It was, it was wonderful. <laughs> and um, I learned early on, and, and Dean, I don't know if you guys will agree with this. If you bake a man cookies or a cake or something, they typically will say, OK. <laughs> so I learned that with um, Toby Thompson and Craig McCart, my two design professors. And I was allowed to go into a pretty rough neighborhood and work with very beleaguered teachers who thought we had all forgotten about them or given up on them. And what we did was to design a proper environment for preschoolers and kindergarten students to have their classwork and their class time. And the kids worked with us. We took the shades down from the windows and the children painted everything they wanted on these huge canvases. And we made all sorts of things that hung from the ceiling and we filled the space with tactility and experience. And it didn't look like an impoverished public school when we were finished. And it was my first piece of press, too. <laughs> and it wasn't until I met Raymond Lowy that I found out how important press is to getting your point across. Because it's um, a blessing and a curse. The paparazzi are everywhere. But you have to have a way to communicate. And so there's a very long-winded answer. Perfect. OK. Thank you very much. Dean? The, question. the question is, uh, just give us your thoughts, generally speaking, around design and innovation. What's your, what's your philosophy? Well, I would violently agree with one principle, which is when people tell you it can't be done or you're nuts, that's what you should work on. If you go to people with an idea and they say, OK, do it. The only thing you know for sure, other than it's probably doable, which if you're a risk-averse person, that's a good thing. But what you know is whatever you're trying to do, even if you succeed, will be incrementally better than what we do now. Nothing wrong with that. The world typically moves at a nice, stable pace, getting incrementally better at everything. There's always hiccups one way or the other. But real innovation happens at the intersection of a whole bunch of technologies that have typically been developed for something else and somebody saying, now we can do something which isn't going to be incremental. We're going to take the same old problem the world has addressed in this way or hasn't been able to address at all. And we're going to address it and solve it in a completely different way. If it all works, and people accept that new way, that's what an innovation is, as distinguished from an invention. Lots of people, particularly at RIT and other institutions, are taught how to make inventions. There's millions of patents out there. The first patent I got started with a three, three million something. Patents that we got recently, this year in 2012, all start with an eight. Eight million something. Trust me, I'm not that old. <laughs> and there haven't been five million innovations since I started playing with technology. And by the way, that's five million that are just patented. There certainly aren't all these millions and millions of innovations. Inventions are clever ways to use technology to create something that was non-obvious, required by the FBI. The patent office, it was, it's non obvious, and nobody did it before. You can invent a lot of things like that. To become an innovation, it has to have started with being a big deal because most people either couldn't even conceive of it or wouldn't believe it's doable, and then it has to be done. And it has to be done so well, people will accept it. And the rub, you said one of the interesting things is you've got to have press. That is a good thing to learn. But 
with or without press, there's something I have found even more fundamental about what it takes to make innovation. And it isn't that you simply succeeded at doing this thing that most people said couldn't be done. Because in reality, most people and organizations and societies are built around keeping things stable. And that's not bad. It's really not bad. But it's got an unintended consequence. By keeping things stable so bad stuff doesn't happen, it also makes it almost impossible for good stuff to happen, even after you prove it's doable and it works. I know today is about innovation. And people always talk about the word innovation as a very positive thing. But that's not what societies typically want. People, and I think it's genetic, it's what keeps us alive, it, what keeps things stable. People are very averse to change of any kind. Even when they don't like where they are, it's the devil they know. Even when the invention worked and could become innovation, it doesn't. Unless a lot of effort goes into it. And again, I mean, we could talk about innovation but as being this great thing, but the last thing you'd want to hear, you're going in for that oh, standard surgery. They've done it 10,000 times. It's an easy one. The last thing you want to hear from that surgeon before they put you out is, I got a great new idea. <laughs> <laughs> you get on a plane today to go home, and you hear, this is a new kind of plane, and never been flown before. Get on. <laughs> most people, in most situations, are very risk averse. So after you solve the problem that most people would have not even recognized as a problem, or wouldn't have believed could be solved, the energy it takes to make that innovation actually part of society, which is what innovation is. The energy it takes to turn the invention into something that meets that high bar, which happens rarely. There's five million inventions. There aren't five million. I mean, if you ask me about innovations in the recent past, considering the whole human time scale, let's see, there was uh, fire, uh, movable type, uh, the TV clicker. I mean, <laughs> the number of things that I'd call innovations in my lifetime are pretty small. So I guess I would agree with the statement, work on the big problems in a big, new, different way. Be prepared to fail. I'll define failure as you couldn't make your design work. If every once in a while you pass that threshold and it works, be prepared to take a long time to be very patient to guide a generation to accept it. I have now come to believe no matter how obvious it is after you've made it work, after it goes from indefensible to indispensable because you know it works, I've come to believe it still takes, by no coincidence, about 20 years. All the business schools will tell you that. It takes about 20 years for innovation to be accepted, and they put it in all these neat terms by business plans and spending, and I think that's a lot of garbage. I think the reason it takes 20 years is because that's about one human generation. And I think we should just define technology as anything that wasn't around when you were a kid. To my grandparents, you know, the telephone was technology. To my parents, you know, maybe television. And, some people in this room, it's the computer. Some people, younger people, it's not even the internet anymore. I mean, most people that are under 20 probably see the internet and toilets the same way. <laughs> They're part of the infrastructure. They're here where we need them. We don't really wonder about how they work. Where does the stuff come from? Where does the stuff go? It's just there and it works. <laughs> but most people that are substantially older than that are still amazed by this stuff. And they're reluctant to transition to depend on it. So it really comes down to the reason it takes 20 years for any innovation to happen is if you grow up with it, you're comfortable with it. You accept it. If you're not, you don't. That's how hard it is to get design to become innovation. So work hard, 
work on the big problems, and then after you solve it when it should be an overnight success, it probably will be, if you're lucky, in 20 years. So be patient. Thank you. Kevin, you have a unique kind of perspective on innovation and design. Share us your thoughts. Well, I, you know, first of all, <clears throat> first of all, we'll turn back on this mic that was on earlier, uh, if they hear me up there. But um, I, first of all, I, I agree with, with Dean and Patty. I, I have always uh, defined innovation at two levels. There's, there's innovation. Oh, there we go. Wow. <laughs> Can you hear me now? <laughs> they thought they could hear me without the mic. You see, a mic is, is an innovation. Uh, the, there's innovation and there's disruptive innovation, and um, it's rare when there's disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation is so innovative it disrupts a market. And you could say it disrupts an entire society, is a lot of what Dean was, was talking about. Um, you could argue the telephone virtually disrupted the way a society communicates. That's a pretty big, movable type, disrupted the way we communicate. Those are big disruptions. Uh, <clears throat> there's other disruptions. I think uh, I'm going to bring a little full circle to Steve Jobs, because most disruptive innovation happens sometimes at universities, often at startups, rarely at big companies. It's just the way it is. And then you go, well, why is that? And, and when you go in and you study that, you find out that what happens in larger companies is you start to form teams and groups and they all get together and talk about what their next product will be. And they think and they're careful. And, they're, and what happens is something in the human experience tells us that we don't want to think so far out of the box that the person next to us is going to laugh at us, is going to cause shame, is going to make us look stupid, or we're going to try something that fails and fails and fails and fails in front of them. So that's why you see a lot of disruptive innovation takes place in, you know, <laughs> at a bar on a napkin with two guys and they're drinking and they, uh, they go, oh, maybe this is a good idea. Because they were able to think out of the box and neither one was, will, was worried about laughing at each other. Uh, so when you get in a large company, and one of the things I think we have to do, certainly in the United States and, and, and in the world, is learn that innovation is taking risks, and that taking those risks is OK and can be rewarded. So we've somehow built our corporations on the fact that if you sit around that table and you think way outside the box, and the corporation actually does that, and, and, and the thing fails, you'll be fired. Well, who wants to take that risk? Instead, you know, why don't you just go do something simple? I often use uh, the example of, of Kleenex, you know, the Kimberly Clark Corporation, who I love, and hopefully there's no one here from Kimberly Clark or the Kleenex Corporation or whatever. But um, it, you could imagine a team uh, asked by the CEO at, at the Kleenex Corporation to go invent the next new Kleenex and think way outside the box. And they get around a table and they think about it for months and years and they go out to uh, focus groups and they do different design competitions and all these kinds of things. And when all is said and done, Three years later, after lots of work, they took the box of Kleenex that had white Kleenex in it and they've come out with pink Kleenex. Interesting, but probably not disruptive. A little innovative, it's interesting, it's not disruptive. Now to be truly disruptive, I'm gonna ask you to think way outside the box. Now you might get fired for this, but if you were around that table, I would hope what you'd say instead is, what business are we really in? Well, we're in the Kleenex business. No, 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 you're saying that because we have plants that take you know, logs and turn them into wood pulp and you know, boil it and make Kleenex and all that stuff. But that's not the business we're in. What people are buying our tissues for is to clean their nose. So in fact, we're in the business of cleaning one's nose. Now, if you really wanted to clean one's nose, maybe instead, to think way outside the box, we would invent the one month snot sucker. And it'd be this huge thing and you'd put it up and clean it for 30 days all at once, right? Now, you wouldn't sell as many Kleenex, but you'd have a clean nose. Now, Dean's probably going to go out and invent that because he's thinking, it's really not a bad thing. <laughs> this is all facetious. The point of the story is nobody's going to go invent that silly thing. The point of the story is that if you really wanted to think outside the box, you'd have to think away from tissues and realize what value you're trying to bring to your consumer. And the value wasn't that you're bringing tissues or pink tissues or purple tissues or anything. The value was you're cleaning their nose. Are there other ways we can accomplish that for them that's way outside the box and maybe doesn't even use our plant infrastructure? Now, if you're the CFO, who I see the CFO of RIT sitting here, that you don't want to use the plant infrastructure, he's going, excuse me. <laughs> we still got to pay for, that, pay for that plant infrastructure. So another reason you see corporations and people in corporations risk averse. So startups tend to be risk prone and you know 90 something percent of them fail. But, but, but you're willing to take those risks and you don't care if you're laughed at. And so disruptive innovation is all about taking huge risks, willing to be personally willing to take those risks. And this is where I'm going to circle right back around to Steve Jobs. Because in Steve Jobs, we had the unique experience, unique experience of a large, 
larger and now very large corporation, almost the, maybe the most valuable corporation on earth. <clears throat> but it wasn't 10, 12 years ago when Steve came back. This was a company that was virtually bankrupt. And Steve came in, and, and he was fired the first time for being too disruptive and too innovative. And so they bring him back, and the board is done, and you know, it do doesn't matter at this point. The thing's going to go belly up in a few months. And he goes, well, yeah, we're going to fix our computer line, but you know, I'm going to come out with a music player. It's going to be the 50th music player on the market, but it'll have a better interface. And I know people are getting the music for free, but I'm going to charge people for their songs. Now, if I'm on that board, I'm going, Steve, I'm sorry, you're gone again. OK, you, you've lost it. You're crazy. But in fact, he had a vision of reinventing the music business in a way it hadn't been invented before. And he thought at 99 cents, people would be willing to pay for the tunes knowing that they're not full of viruses or bugs or looking for them all over the world. They just have, by the way, that vision was absolutely right on. Absolutely right on. In a way, he disrupted the music business, which was going to be disrupted anyway, but he disrupted it in a reasonable way. And, and, and started that company on a consumer product uh, category that then he said, well, you know, I could put a real operating system around this and make the iPod touch. And then I could take that and why not build a phone? Now, today we sit here and go, well, an iPhone, of course. I mean, computer companies didn't make phones when they came out with the iPhone. It was a ridiculous concept that a computer company would be in the phone business. But he saw the intersection of those and said, let's just do it. And by then, he had had the mandate from the board that said, look, we don't understand you. We don't agree. It doesn't matter. Just what you usually write, just go do it. So we had the rare glimpse of someone who had a mandate at the highest level to risk the company at each stage. And when they came out with the iPad and they built 3 million of them, could have risked the entire company on it. And now they've sold 67 million as of the end of last quarter, which is unbelievable, on the way to 100 million iPads and 300 million iPhones. And the numbers are staggering. Um, the vision was right, and he had the power of a large enough corporation and brand to actually execute it. And if all of our corporations could do that, it'd be an amazing thing. If Kodak could do it, if Xerox could do it, if Bosch and Loam could do it, I could go right down the line, right? But it's very hard to do that at large corporations. He had the unique mandate to do it, and we can all learn from, from that ability to take risk and that ability of a board to allow him to take the risk. Very nice. I'm going to um, play on this a little bit because uh, in one of the topics I was going to introduce a little later, uh, it talks about design-driven innovation. Okay, So here's another quote from our friend Steve. He, he said, uh, it's really hard to design products by focus groups. A lot of times people don't know what they want until you show it to them. So uh, Roberto Verganti, uh, a famous designer, uh, but also uh, an author of Design Driven Innovation, How to Compete by Radically Innovating the Meaning of Products, has a thesis that um, the literature on innovation right now has focused either on radical innovation pushed by technology or incremental innovation pulled by the market. And I think we've already seen uh, some of those uh, principles in our discussions as well. But uh, Verganti introduces a third strategy, and that's a, a radical shift in the perspective of introducing a bold new way of competing. Design-driven innovations do not come from the market, but rather they create new markets. They don't push new technologies. Uh, they push new meanings. So it's about having a vision and taking that vision to the customers. Uh, Kevin already mentioned the Apple iPod, but another example is Nintendo's Wii product, for example, created a whole new market with its motion sensitive controller. They overturned our understanding of what video games means and, and how we listen to music. So with that as a framework, um, and continuing on some of these comments already, what, what, Patty, what are some thoughts that you might have given your work around this notion of creating a new market with a vision and having design drive innovation. Well, this is, this is your fault. Um, <laughs> I'm going to tell a Kimberly Clark story. <laughs> I got called in in uh, 1980 to a very secret meeting outside of Atlanta. I was not told who the company was. I was not told what we were working on until we were billeted in a very, very discreet setting. I could not show you where it was. We weren't blindfolded, but it was almost like that. And when I got the brief and opened the folder, what I saw before me was a directive to create a way that adults with incontinence could be 
productive citizens. I think that was the terminology. And my reaction was a little South Buffalo and a little Irish, well, maybe a lot of Irish, and I thought, sweet Jesus, these people are out of their minds. Um, so you, you have to remember, when we talk about this 20-year thing, it's very true. But in this case, dealing with adult incontinence is a topic, a subject, an arena that is still as tender today as it was in 1980. And I think we might be looking at a couple of generations before we get this one right. But I realized that as twisted as this positioning was, uh, we had to do something equally twisted. So they gave us the product that was being used in skilled nursing centers. So people who were essentially at that point in their lives where they no longer ambulated, they weren't able to get up and take a walk in a garden, they weren't able to toilet themselves. Um, one of the great indignities of an adult life. And we took those products and we made all the boys, being the only broad, um, put them on. And let's face it, ladies, we have a leg up, so to speak, because we menstruate. So you guys, this is really uncomfortable terrain because you didn't have a precursor. You didn't have a period of your life where you understood collection of bodily fluids like women do. Although I also have to say, I always felt somehow denied some passage, some rite of passage, because my mommy never walked on a beach with me and explained menstrual care. And uh, I think she threw some tampons at me and said, you're a woman. Um, you know, so I really felt deprived. All of this is talking about the human factor in how design makes the difference. They had a product that collected urine and feces. But you didn't want to go outside. You didn't want your friends to see you. You could not participate in life and living. And so it had to be designed. The technology was there, but there wasn't really a product. Um, I have worked uh, with every company that has made products for urinary and fecal collection, and also with NASA. And you want to talk about a nose problem. A menstruating astronaut is a big problem in space. So this is really where design humanizes. I haven't really thought of that till just now. I, <laughs> I, knew, I knew we were going to be best friends. And yeah, you can call. I'm at the double tree tonight, so you can call me at 3 when you wake up from a nightmare because you're having space <laughs> dreams and you're incontinent and you're in a nursing home. You can call me. It's OK. Um, I'll talk you down. But hopefully I'll raise your spirits, because the point is that that's the role of design. There is nothing more wondrous and beautiful and innovative than design melded with know-how, design and material technology, design that becomes innovation because of the human connection. That, I think, ultimately is design. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin or Dean, you want to you want to throw any of your ideas around around design-driven innovation in particular? I don't. Is Dr. Dessler here yet? So most people don't know. Since he came to RIT, he's been wearing Depends, and this is something that they haven't really wanted to talk about. I'm absolutely kidding. Uh, but you didn't know it because it was designed so the, well. That is the point. Kevin, by the way, is an RIT trustee. I just want to make sure that everyone understands. That. Yeah, no, no, no. it was a joke, guys. I know it's on video. They'll erase that part. It's, um, well, look, it, it is absolutely true uh, that design of product uh, uh, means the world, uh, especially in the consumer realm. Um, it's really interesting. I give a couple of antidotes, but Samsung, I think, is a great antidote. You know. Uh, many of you may remember the Samsung of 20 or 25 years ago, uh, you know, South Korean company trying to push some consumer electronics into this, uh, uh, into this uh, country. And, uh, you know, the designs were terrible and they made no sense and nobody wanted anything to do with them. And they, they would look at Apple and a few on Sony at that time who had, you know, much more beautiful designs. And finally they went out and hired a real design team. And in fact, contracted with some of the, you know, great design teams in the, in the U.S. and started coming out with really beautifully designed products. 
uh, to rival some of the best stuff we had ever done here. And then their, then their brand took off, their brand equity took off, uh, the products took off. It's, it's really, really interesting. And today, you don't think of Samsung as some you know, backwards, terrible little South Korean. It's really a, you know, one of the major brands that you, you'd be proud to have a Samsung TV in your, in, in, in your living room. And that wasn't the case 15 or 20 years ago. And so uh, I don't think you're going to get even disruptive products accepted with poor design. Uh, you could argue <clears throat> that we've had tablet computers in a variety of ways uh, long before <laughs> the iPad. In fact, one of the first was, was from Apple. It was called the Newton. And, and there was a product from General Magic. And there were a, hand, a handful of, of, of things from Fujitsu and others that used the Microsoft operating system for tablets for, for two decades. This is not new. But, but, but what Apple did, and, and what Steve did, and that team did, was say, we've got to raise the level of design and make this so usable and so interesting. And, and there's things we're not going to have on it. Word, Excel, it won't be on it. It's not, 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 not in our target market anyway. And, uh, and they hit that out of the park. And to a great extent, they were disruptive because of the quality of design and because of the sense of design and style. And that was probably true with the iPod, too. You know, there were lot, lots of. Lots of uh, MP3 players out there. So I think there's great evidence of, of, uh, of, of, of where uh, design has to come together uh, with these inventions. And, uh, and if they don't, you know, like you said, there's lots of ways to, to absorb bodily fu fluids, but there's only a few that you can, you can wear and would be acceptable. And that was absolutely key. Okay. Dean, anything to add to the bodily fluid conversation or, <laughs> or design in general? from this perspective of pushing to new markets? So actually, actually, my day job, we do design lots of things. I mean, my day job is building medical devices for people with some pretty serious conditions. We've delivered 200 million cassettes for people to do their own dialysis, a life support system, in the dignity of their own bedroom, instead of in a center somewhere watching their blood circulate in some extracorporeal path, sitting next to four other people like an assembly line. And in many places, you'd have to drive two hours to get there and be feeling pretty crummy when you had to drive home. So the fundamental technology of dialysis has been around 20 or 30 years, but designing something that I personally believed would make a big difference uh, again, is not easy to sell to people. In fact, our client, one of the biggest companies in the world for dealing with this technology, came to us because they wanted a better version of the machine they had. They knew we have a lot of good engineers. And we looked at their problem and I said, could we make your machine better, smaller, quieter, more reliable, cheaper? Probably. But I think that's a perverse incentive. All that would do is keep these places going longer. You're trying to solve the wrong problem. Uh, you've got to give these people something that will prolong their life, not prolong their death. You've got to change your expectation. And we went out and said, we're going to build a machine that you could self-administer a life support therapy. And we, of course, back to the beginning, were told categorically by all the experts, we were nuts, which is why, of course, we did it. Um, but I would just be redundant if I, I agree with everything we heard here. Most of the projects we do are like that, like the iBot, which you're familiar with. You know, For 200 years, people get around in wheelchairs, and the incremental improvements in wheelchairs are pretty pathetic. Uh, you pointed out. You know, the, the customer, that old saying, the customer's always night or light, right, or listen to the focus groups. I don't think you have to go to Steve Jobs to realize that that is good when you're making incremental improvements. You go to the focus group today to make next year's car. And that's a pretty good way to figure out what you want. Because everybody now believes cars all have engines that work. They don't even open the hood before they buy them. They don't know how many cylinders the engines have. 30 years ago, that was a big deal. They know that the transmit, they know everything works. The big decision between this car and that car is where are the cup holders? And if you want to know the right place for cup holders, you do focus groups. But you're not making, you're not making innovations in cars these days. 
in any place where there's innovation, I don't think you have to go to the recent examples. I mean, 100, over 100 years ago, Henry Ford said, I'm not going to go to focus groups, because over 100 years ago, if you ask people, what do you want, they'd say, a faster horse. Uh, that's what they had. That's what they wanted to improve. Uh, I would take the extreme position when it comes to innovation. The last people you want is that focus group. Completely agree. Because Completely. those people aren't innovators. If they were, they wouldn't be in the focus group. Mm -hmm. They'd be on your team trying to figure out mm -hmm. what to offer people. And I'd say the focus group, by definition, if you do it well, will give you insights as to how to make those incremental improvements so that what they got is a little better. Uh, categorically, I would agree with both of you and say the last one I would talk to, if I'm trying to come up with an innovation, is a customer that's sort of happy with the garbage they have now. Uh, that's not the standard that an innovator is going to live with. Um, I've already learned, by the way, two big things about the process so far sitting here, but I am concerned because I know that you want to talk about universal design. And until a few minutes ago, I thought that would be possible, because after all, all people are the same. So universal design should fit everybody. But I've now learned, for instance, how different people are. Women get there by baked cookies. Guys get there by sitting in a bar. <laughs> and uh, I don't think we're ever going to pass that. So uh, anyway, I'll, I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. Well, I think, I think we've seen some great examples of uh, our panelists articulating where design drives the innovation to a large extent. And of course, their experiences in the, in the industry and working in the fields are, are good examples of that, from the, the segue to the designs to help the elderly to the, to the innovative efficiency windows in there. So I think uh, that's a testimony to uh, Verganti's thesis there on that. Let's, let's turn to universal design. Uh, of course, RIT is both proud and blessed to be uh, the host uh, for our National Technical Institute for the Deaf. Uh, we're proud because we're one of two federally funded uh, institutions of higher learning for the deaf and hard of hearing community. But we're really quite blessed because it makes RIT a, a living learning laboratory for inclusive excellence. It is through the embracing of uh, our deaf and hard of hearing uh, students that our hearing students uh, have demanded more sections of American Sign Language so that they can learn to communicate with our deaf and hard of hearing students than we can possibly offer enough of. Uh, we have a commitment to accessibility, as witnessed by our interpreters standing in front of me. And we have a commitment to capture our videos that we use in our classrooms so that all students have access to the learning materials um, that our faculty present. So Universal Designs does refer to this broad spectrum of ideas meant to produce buildings and products and environments that are inherently accessible to people without disabilities and people with disabilities. So we know that our panelists, uh, in some form, in some way, have uh, dealt with these issues. Uh, let me start again with Patty, who probably has a unique perspective on this. So, Patty, tell us a little bit about your perspective on universal design and what, what might be important for our students who are budding designers or our students in the engineering fields to think about from that angle. Well, the starting point for me would be to tell you no one's disabled. And I mean this from the bottom of my heart. It's always troubled me that when I began my career uh, in 1972, which, with my first paid project for Xerox, I was a sophomore at the time, working upstairs, um, I challenged something Xerox had in their brief. They said they wanted to do something for disabled people, and I said, well, I don't think that's even possible because I don't understand what that means. And then they wanted to talk to the dean because he was supposedly giving them a smart student. Um, <laughs> and I'm still fighting this battle of words. I don't believe that we should call anybody disabled. 
I get very emotional about it because I don't think we can say someone is disabled until we see them interfacing with something we've created. Uh, someone who can't be, um, can, someone who can't ambulate, someone who can't make a meal, someone who can't toilet, someone who can't get from one place to another. That's how we started to define level of ability. So I would rather argue that everyone has personal, unique, snowflake individuality and capacity and ability. And I can tell you in my career, I've never been able to design anything for a disability. I design for capacity, I design for ability. And I, I think, Dean, we, we agree on this point. I've never designed anything for disability. It makes no sense. And yet, and I don't want to sound too disparaging, but here goes. Um, when the brand boys are at the table, this is where they're like, what the hell is she talking about? Uh, and, and we still are nowhere near where we need to be. I see the attitude towards capacity and individual ability as perplexing and as separatist, as racism, religious intolerance, gender bias. I see it as one of the most hurtful forces in our lives today. And right now we're working with Wounded Warriors and the Luke Arm is, is being featured in a special issue of Innovation Magazine that I'm guest editing this summer. Um, so I know Dean's passionate about this as well. We don't see someone who's damaged and disabled. We see someone who wants to enhance their ability level. And that's the starting point for me on any design. Um, I'm, I'm passionate about this. I will never use the word. I will never help a client use the word. I'd rather focus on what is the positive aspect of an individual's life, not what is supposedly wrong with them. It just doesn't translate for me. Thank you. Thank you. Inspiring words. Gentlemen? Well, to once again agree, but to generalize that the words sort of matter, but again, to generalize that the public, the non-innovators that need to be shown something so that they know what they want are the ones that control the words, and each time they attempt to fix it, I think they don't get to the heart of it. They don't change anything other than the word, which has the same flaw in the logic. Namely, they're going after what's wrong, not what's right. And I think to prove that, I'd say to all of you, they're always trying with these incrementalism changes. When I was a kid, somebody was crippled. And after a while, that became such a horrible word. Nobody would use that. So we went to people were handicapped. We were proud of that word. It was on every sign in every building, and there was handicap access. But after a generation of that, that word came to have as much taint to it as crippled. So we went to disabled. And the people that said nobody's crippled said that they were handicapped. But after a generation, they look at you and say, they're not handicapped, they're disabled. And now we've gone about another 20 years, and the word disabled carries the same negative. Well, why shouldn't it? Because all three of those words, you're translating into the same thing. That person couldn't do something. So I kind of internally chuckle at how people that don't have solutions always have better words and euphemisms. I don't really get into that stuff. I never did. I mean, as a kid, I used to listen to people talk about the big philosophical debates. Is the glass half empty or is the glass half full? I remember as a kid saying to somebody, well, since we all know the definition of the word half, if it's really at that point, your question is inane, irrelevant, pathetic, and stupid. Uh, but what I'd rather worry about is, is the water in that glass drinkable? Is it safe? If it's not, how do we make it that way? Does everybody on this planet have access to clean water? And if not, why not? How do we fix it? Now, those are interesting questions, but not for the people that play with euphemisms. And we're not going to get past the problems by, in 20 years, getting rid of crippled, handicapped, disabled. We're going to give people eye bots. We're going to give people prosthetic limbs that aren't a hook on the end of a stick. 
we're going to use technology to empower people in ways that make them smile. And we don't need a label for that, which is this generation's version of being condescending to people that we're uncomfortable dealing with and by being unimaginative about how to deal with real problems by giving them cute names and throwing them in the dark corners. I've spent most of my life trying to make things like iBots to help people that can't walk up a flight of stairs get to where they want to go. Now we're working with some of the most incredibly brave people I've ever seen. When we went to one of the first visits where we took one of our Luke arms, I warned my bunch of engineers. I had controls engineers, systems engineers, the guys making the sensors. I said, look, we're going to a military hospital. Walking down this hallway, you're going to think you went into a place that's a junkyard for body parts. IEDs have really bad effects on people. Some of these young people have gotten here recently. They may still have open lesions. They're going to be angry, frustrated, depressed. You have to help perk them up and show them that there's hope here. I was so wrong, it was unbelievable. Because we went in there, and these aren't octogenarians or older people that we've all come to understand start to have more limited capabilities. And when you see them in a hospital, it's kind of a natural progression. Some of these were special forces kids. You know, their, their neck was bigger than my body. These, these, they were powerful people, but some of them literally were missing not one arm, but bilateral, both arms. Or not one leg, but both legs. But we're sitting there talking to them. They were so energized. They were so positive. They were so excited by what we could give back. They kept thanking us for being there. And I felt so guilty being thanked by these people that had already literally given up their arms. I, I didn't know what to say, but we left there and I said to every one of my engineers, well, I thought we went there, among other things, to give these people some hope and incentive and confidence. And I think they inspired us. We got to go back and work harder. The language is not the way to solve the problem. It's focusing on using technologies to design things so that the world, and particularly some people more than others, um, can take advantage of technologies to have better lives. And the only place that I'd say the language is, is problematic is because when most people hear those words, they actually internalize them and they lower their expectations to that incrementalism. And that's why I think it took 100 years for some of these things to be, in fact, putting those handicapped access signs on buildings. Everybody felt good about it when they passed the ADA. Probably people in this room feel good about it. When I was having trouble getting people to understand why the iBot, this stair climbing wheelchair, this device that could allow you to stand up and balance and look people in the eye. It was from that technology that almost the fun project, the Segway evolved. When I was having trouble and we went to Washington and we were pretty much told people don't need this, we have ADA. Government officials were drinking their Kool-Aid believing ADA solves a problem. I was so frustrated I did something probably not very politically correct. I took one of those pictures that has that standard symbol of the sort of the wheel with the chair. You know, it's, you'd see it on buildings or on highways. Handicap access. I took that picture and we photoshopped it with an arrow pointing one way into that very famous picture, I think it was Brown versus Board or whatever it was, from the 1950s. I just, a black and white picture from a textbook, a history textbook, that showed a water fountain. 
and an arrow on a sign above it, colored people. And they said it was separate but equal. That it was a sign in a public building. I think that would horrify most people here. Well, no, no, you see, they have water, we have water, they have water, what's the problem? See, there was a sign that said, water fountain. When you look at that, and I urge you to all go look at it, it's a pretty famous picture. I took that picture, handicapped, I put it on there, and I went back to Washington. I went back to our government officials. I said, you know, somebody can't walk in the front door of a restaurant with me, even if they actually are in compliance with these great rules that you're so proud of. I walk in the front door of the restaurant, I leave them, they go around the back, maybe past the dumpster, past the garbage, up a flight of stairs with some help from somebody, and they get put in the corner, probably next to the kitchen or the restrooms, where they have met the legal requirement that somebody that couldn't walk in the front door can sit here. I don't know who made that standard. It was all well-intentioned. But 30 years ago, people were proud of those handicap signs. They put them up because they, look, see, we're doing it. Now, that's long gone, it's disabled. But I would bet in the lifetime of all the students here, the word disabled will be as offensive to people as the word crippled. But just solving the language problem isn't gonna solve it. We've gotta change people's expectations about what's possible, and we've gotta change your expectations about what we should all be spending our time and energy doing. It's easy to get distracted, to go and do all sorts of things that are fun or even profitable, that are at best meaningless and in the end have unintended consequences that are bad. And good design starts with saying, if we succeed at this, will we be proud of it? Not just the intended consequence, but down the road, will we look back at this and be proud of it? Or will we look back at this and wonder why we wasted our time? Or how, what were we thinking when we implemented that? Thank you, thank you. Thought provoking. Uh, before we go on, I, I wanted to remind everyone here in the audience and then uh, those out in ether space here that uh, they can write their questions and forward them to Kelly Ritter, who is here in the corner. Uh, they can tweet their questions to hash mark A-S-K-I-H-F, ask I-H-F. Uh, so hash mark ask I-H-F. So uh, we have a couple of questions coming in, um, but before we get to that one, I'm gonna turn to Kevin way down here and I'm obliged to t throw in uh, this last topic here uh, because this is RIT. We have a president who uh, drives an electric vehicle or uh, electric hybrid vehicle, who rides his bike into campus, who, who has brought sustainability to RIT in a big way. Uh, of course, we have our architecture program with a focus on sustainability as well and uh, inside our Institute of Sustainability. So we're gonna move to sustainability, design, and innovation. The global warming trend has provided a need for innovative design from a sustainability perspective. Uh, so Kevin, I'm gonna start with, with you. Can, uh, can innovation and can design in particular save the world? Uh, do, uh, more than one word answer? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, theoretically, yes. I mean, I mean, I think that the challenge for many of us, and uh, I, I'm not sure if Dean feels the same way, but I'm, I'm going to bet he does, is that, you know, as a <clears throat> sort of an inventor and a, a, somewhat a scientist background, etc., you start to also look at the human experience and what humans have traditionally done. And um, and I can bring up account after account after account. Easter Island is probably one of the easiest ones to understand. Uh, you know, the population got bigger, continued to use all the resources. Eventually, they fought over the last tree, chopped it down, and killed themselves. You know, eventually, because there was no more food and there was no more shade, and they couldn't raise animals, and the whole thing died. Um, the, the human experience teaches us that in almost uh, every case uh, in the course of human history, um, the selfishness of humans, either as a country, as a town, as a village, as a tribe, whatever it is, 
uh, uh, ultimately wins out over what's best for the entire existence of humanity. I hope that doesn't happen again, but that's what's traditionally happened. And so I, I struggle with uh, will humanity um, address uh, the issues of global warming, or will we indeed fight over pulling out the last drop of oil out of the ground? Fight. I mean, tooth, nail, nuclear bombs, everything else. And um, it, it, it's hard to believe that we won't be fighting some, somewhere over that last drop of oil. Now, by the way, I think oil is completely a wonderful thing to have to you know, make plastics and other things, because we, we probably won't get any more. We're going to burn it and put it all in the atmosphere where it's poison. It's, it's not poison when it's in the ground. It's poison when we put it in the atmosphere and we, and we breathe it, and, and, and more than that, and when it creates you know, a greenhouse gas situation uh, for us. So uh, in, the, in the recent experience, I think, with, uh, with the fracking, for those who, who know what that is, uh, you, I think you know some of this in upstate New York with natural gas. I mean, it's driven natural gas prices to arguably energy prices, the lowest they've been almost in history, at under two bucks per, per million BTU. The, the, these are historically incredibly low costs. And that, you know, natural gas is a fossil fuel, don't kid yourself. It's about half the CO2 in an electric power plant than, than coal is, but uh, you know, it's not 99% less. And so, uh, and now there's a huge run to natural gas and a huge run to burn, you know, gas, gas-fired plants and to export gas now. And, and so, what, what, what dawns on me is that economic trumps all. And unless we can make the economics absolutely work, absolutely work. Uh, and, and an example, you know, this entire campus could theoretically run off of solar, the entire campus. It would not be economically viable to do so in Rochester, New York. And, uh, and in fact, the amount of battery storage you'd need and, you know, and everything else, would, it, 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 it'd be virtually impossible, even with whatever incentives, what few incentives there are in New York State. Uh, uh, it, it doesn't mean that solar won't get there someday and blah, 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 but right now, uh, gr you know, grid parity, um, uh, uh, simple concept. Grid parity is when you can put solar in and it's the same price as what you were buying from the grid. Okay, great. You can do that in California because uh, for a facility like this, you'd be paying 35 cents a kilowatt hour during the day. So you, with some incentives, absolutely you can put in solar all day. Now let's say I'm a utility that generates most of my power. I'm a utility now, not a user, that generates most of my power from old coal plants. Cost me three cents a kilowatt hour to generate that power, three, three and a half cents or so. At three and a half cents, solar is nowhere near giving me grid parity for me, the, the generator of electricity. So we've got a long way to go, and economics trumps all. And unfortunately, uh, humans run towards the cheapest thing. And so, you know, can design save us? Sure. Uh, can technology save us? Absolutely. Do we have all the technologies we already need? to be you know, fossil fuel free in 10 years, theoretically. Do we have the economic willpower to do it? No, in fact, we don't even have the economic might to do it, let alone the, let alone the willpower to do it, economic or otherwise. And so it really gets down to an economic problem. And, I, and, and it's very hard for the technologies we have to both save energy and to create energy to compete in a world with other things that had 150 years to come down the cost curve. And they've got to come down the cost curve in 10 or 20 years. It's just really hard to get all the way down there. You know, you can pull a barrel of oil, regardless of what it costs us to buy, pull a barrel of oil out of the ground in much of the world for about five bucks a barrel. Five bucks a barrel. So the price of it has nothing to do with the cost of, of pulling it out of the ground. And, and so if you're an energy producer and you're getting your energy raw at five dollars a barrel, hard to compete with. Hard to compete with. What we really need is worldwide policy that drives this to happen. Mm. And you know, the simplest, obviously, is on a worldwide basis, uh, a carbon tax that slowly increases every year. And you know where it's going to go over the next 20 years. And economics trumps all, and it'll all work for everybody. Every company, every university, every, every power producer, everyone using power will figure out to, how to use it more efficiently, and we'll figure out how to generate it cleanly, because there's just no choice. There's no choice, because you know what's coming, and it's getting worse every year. But without that economic imperative, you know, humans have unfortunately proven that they, you know, they run to the cheapest thing and the cheapest fuel and the cheapest food and the cheapest everything. And, uh, and so it's, it's worrisome. But Dean, you may have a different, different perspective on it, but I worry about it. So I'll leave you with that and hand it over to my good friend over here. It won't shock you. I don't disagree with any of that. But I would add that 
it isn't just economics that we run to what looks like the simplest or the fastest or the cheapest solution and typically get it wrong. Again, I think most people aren't that sophisticated in terms of looking at the unintended consequences of everything they do and frequently uh, manage to make decisions that aren't, in the long run, in their own enlightened self-interest. And the best solution to that is getting people really educated, hence universities. Uh, if everybody in the world was a graduate of a university, had learned a little bit of analytic thinking and could project out the consequences of what we all do, we would do a lot of things differently instead of being as self-destructive, not just by wars, but by lots of things we do. But I would add, to give all of you a headache, <laughs> it's not just that you could pull oil out of the ground so cheaply that it's hard to imagine uh, these other infrastructures becoming real anytime soon because people can manipulate as they will the marketplace. Americans or sophisticated technology people uh, have a bad habit. It came from a couple of hundred years of dominating the world of innovation and being the the culture and the, the, literally the place that the world uh, admired and aspired to be like. And at least until this generation, we've been pretty good at drinking our own Kool-Aid. And we think those of us that I'll, maybe with a little bit of di disparagement called the tree huggers, that's the naive side that think that just if we put enough pain on ourselves, we'll fix the world's problems. A lot of religious, uh, uh, ethnic background causes, you know, I got a Jewish mother, you know, you got to feel guilty about everything. <laughs> but, but to put perspective on how, let's say, big this problem is, I'll give you two pieces of data, which aren't even what the price of a barrel of oil is, but why we have to think much more globally about design to solve just the energy problem. Here's two pieces of data for you. And I'm picking them carefully uh, to make a point. I didn't include all class eight trucks, those great big trucks that use a lot of fuel and a lot of horsepower and they typically run 16 or 18 or 20 hours a day. My, the data is passenger cars in North America, which you might think is most of, it might be most of the vehicles, and I'll be the first to admit, it's nowhere near most of the CO2 generations but passenger cars in North America make greenhouse gases in the form of CO2. Hmm. Cows produce manure that make greenhouse gases, methane. For each gram of methane you produce, you have 21 times, not 21%, 21 times more negative impact in terms of greenhouse gas than you do with CO2. By the way, the methane, CH4, eventually degrades, goes in the atmosphere, lightning, whatever, turns CH4 into CO2 and H2O. It becomes CO2 anyway. But before it does that, it spends a little time with 21 times the negative impact on global warming. Now, if you added up the effect of all the CO2 produced by all the passenger car traffic in North America, you'd get a number. You'd get a number. It's about 2% of the greenhouse gas produced, and it's, now, it's a couple of year old data. It's about 2%. I'm sure there's some smart person that's going to decide, no, it was 1.6 or 3.0. It isn't 82%, it isn't nearly zero, it's 2%. People could scoff at that, but if you could tomorrow lower by 2%, that would be a lot. So imagine us Americans, we want to lead the world, we feel responsible, we've consumed so much of its energy for so long. We want to take the lead, so we're gonna say, we're gonna reduce by 2% all greenhouse gases. Oh, I know how to do that, maybe we get the president or somebody to come out and say, Listen, everybody in America, 
to show our leadership and real concern for the environment, we want everybody that drives a passenger car to just throw their keys away and never drive again. Maybe we got a popular president, maybe he could pull that off and we'll all do that, I don't know. I don't think he'd be very popular, I doubt it would work. But if you could do that, it would be 2%. It turns out, and the reason I picked the other number, is if you went to all the developing world and you looked at all the cows making all that methane, and could go out and collect that methane, and instead of letting it go into the environment, its fuel, you could, on a local basis, collect it and burn it to quickly turn it into electricity in small plants, and then CO2, you would have about the same effect, reducing global greenhouse gases by about 2%. So instead of saying to everybody in this rich, highly technical country we have, because we want to feel good about ourselves, go drive a smaller car, we could say that the only real impact is you'll feel good about yourself. But remember, we have about 300 million people there's, let's say, 7.3 billion people on the planet. So 300 million is the 0.3. The United States, our entire population, is on the other side of the decimal point. We are in the rounding era. And we could be swatting at these flies with our more efficient cars. We could be swatting at the flies, but we're going to get trampled by the elephants because those seven billion people want to have a little bit higher quality of life, a little bit better standard of living over the next 10 years. And what if they have the outrageous goal of going from living with an average income of a dollar a day to two dollars a day? We all know what the extra dollar a day for those few billion people is going to be spent on, water and energy. If we have the rest of the world follow our pattern of making energy the way we do, if you all gave up your cars, it would be in the incidental rounding eras. If instead we, this highly developed country, said let's make m appliance sized things that we could put out around the world, creating a whole industry for us to make these things, and around the world it would produce electricity at the village level for everybody that's never used electricity, which is a few billion people. But in the process, besides creating an industry and creating allies and friends and educating people because they'll have electricity to run computers and phones, LED lights. You could think of these little boxes as environmental vacuum cleaners that are sucking out the greenhouse gases and turning them into a much better form. But that's a design issue. We've got to figure out what we want to do. We've got to figure out a way to make it a win-win for everybody and then implement it. As you say, you know, people will always do what they think is in their best economic interest in the short run. But I would bet if it were properly designed and we gave the American public the choice, you can all give up driving your cars to achieve a 2% reduction and maybe the world will follow. Or we can build a whole new industry of supplying small distributed power plants to the rest of the world so that instead of our 19 century model of big plants that make a gigawatt of which 600 megawatts is killing fish in a river and 400 megawatts is going out of the transmission lines, instead make a million appliances a month until everybody in the world has a way to make energy that's sustainable, cost effective, improves the environment, gives them opportunities for education and health care, and oh, by the way, you can still drive a car. Dean, I've got it. Depends for cows. <laughs> right? Huh? Hook them right up. So he's joking. <laughs> I built two of these machines. I put them in two separate villages in Bangladesh. And for six months, we ran these two electric generation systems and electrified two little villages. They were small, 20 family, 30 family village. And for six months, they had electricity that they never had before. And for six months, the only fuel that went into my little boxes was cow dung. Mm -hmm. And for six months, they ran per there, there was no outage. I mean, that was, Con Edison can't say that. And, <laughs> and it worked. And we proved the technology. Now we've got to implement the design of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to make sure we get to some of the questions from the audience. Uh, so I'm going to jump right into them. 
Um, here is uh, one of them. Uh, maybe this one can, uh, we can be uh, a quick response. Uh, the term innovation is overused today. Can each speaker suggest a cinnamon for the word innovation? Disruptive innovation. Disruptive, okay. It's not exactly a synonym, but. And again, I'm saying this seriously. I would say to a client, we're gonna make you a lot of money. It resonates, I'm sorry. Wow. There you go. Okay. Another uh, individual has asked about um, taking risks and failures. So they really would like to know, what are your favorite failures? What's your favorite failure? Oh, well, you know, was it a technology failure or, or, or not is the question. I mean, most of the time you eventually get the technology to work, but then uh, the market uh, isn't ready for it. Uh, made a product uh, back in the early 90s that could surf the web wirelessly from your computer in 1992. Unfortunately, there was no web to surf. So we sort of missed that point. Uh, all you could get to was something called a BBS, which most of you don't even know what they were. Some of you do, bulletin board systems and stuff like that. So uh, I'd be in the, it was called an air communicator. I'd be in the airport and getting my weather forecast uh, for Boston. And people would come over and, how do you do that? How, well, there's an antenna hooked up to your notebook. I said, yeah, we make this device called an air communicator. We were 10 years too early. And uh, often you can be either way too early or way too late with a spectacular technology, and it just doesn't matter. Good example. Um, this one's pretty current. It's um, a light rail vehicle design we did. And um, just found out last week, actually, maybe it's not a mistake after all. There's a company in Germany that might make it. So, but that was a big failure for about 10 years. It bothered me, because I know I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> I have way, way too many failures to make it short. But I'll just say the way I deal with that, because I am self-delusional, you have to be if you want to get up in the morning and try to do things that everybody's telling you are nuts. So my delusion is, no, that project didn't fail. I'm sure it's going to be an overnight success in about 20 years. And when we have trouble making something succeed because we either decide we're too early or too late, or the technology can't really deliver what we want. We didn't fail. We just put it aside, work on something else, and we're going to get back to it when it's the right time and the technology's there. And everybody has to find ways to uh, protect your ego. So instead of just looking in the mirror and saying, yeah, you actually are as dumb as everybody said, uh, we just keep working at it. We put it aside. The only time we admit failure is if we realize that somebody else has actually come up with a better design that solves this problem in a way that we never thought of. It's no longer a problem, so we stop. That's a failure. Mm. But most of the problems we work on are so big, even if we didn't succeed yet, we don't consider it a failure. It's just a work in process, and we'll one day get there. I didn't go to the business school. I don't have all their words. I don't have the philosophy of how to do it. I think I'm just a descendant of a cockroach. You can keep stepping on us, but we will not die. We'll come back. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, another individual was interested in crowdsourced innovation, replacing singular invent inventors and innovators in the future due to social media and technology, the idea that uh, uh, a group of us are smarter than just one of us at a time. Um, anyone have any thoughts about uh, crowdsource innovation as, re as the new wave? It, it's a new field. Uh, it's only just, I would say, it's very, very infancy. People are trying it. There's, there's a, a good example of a, of a, of a gold mine that uh, everybody said you, you won't find gold in that, mine and, uh, in that mine, and they went on the web just a few years ago and, and crowdsourced. The, uh, the finding of the gold. And in fact, they did find uh, the gold uh, doing that uh, using some software that lots and lots of people looked and dug and watched their eyes and did all these things. It turns out it was a, it was a problem that a million people could solve that one person couldn't easily. Uh, I don't think any of those people got shares in the company, and the company did very well. So you have to decide how this crowdsourcing thing works. <clears throat> but, uh, but, but boy, it's a very, very unique 
perspective on the way we can innovate, and it's never been available to any kind of innovator really in the past until the tools have recently become available over the last you know few years. So I think it's going to be either a huge, unbelievable thing that happens, or it's going to be a, a complete disaster because maybe you can't crowdsource innovation. Number one, uh, the, the second thing is then there's the intellectual property issues. And those can't easily be dealt with when you've got a million people tinkering with something. So you get things like Linux, of course, that's open source. You could argue that uh, that's in a way a crowdsourced innovation. But those are truly open source, and you, you know you don't just because you added something to it, you don't get to claim some some ownership of it. It's it's all open. And uh, the best innovations, because they cost money and take time and take really smart people to be involved and take him to hire a bunch of people, have to give us some money back somehow. And so you sort of get into these two issues. Be interesting to see how they're solved. Hmm. I think it is the new economy for a lot of um, product development. You, you know, Ryan Eater's um, wonderful equipment for uh, people with paraplegia being able to go to a gym and lift weights. Uh, student project, University of Cincinnati, won every industrial design award possible before he graduated. And we tried for five years to get money to help him make this dream come true. Well, it was only with this technology and sending out a lot of twits and tweets and all that stuff that he finally now has the money. He also now owns a company that uh, has a lot of owners. And so it's going to be interesting to see how do we really maintain quality and how do we drive good design when you're answering to so many cooks. And this is the piece of it that I'm watching with um, a lot of interest because I do think these new collaboratives and consortia are the only way we're going to see some of the budgets that we require for subject areas and matters that people just don't find sexy enough to move forward with. Dean, any comments? I think crowdsource stuff on the internet is one of the many areas that I'm not competent to have an intelligent opinion. Okay. Fair enough. All right, the next three questions were questions di uh, directed to specific panelists. And uh, so we have three of them for our three panelists here. So Patty, here's, here's a question that someone in the audience, uh, it's actually a series of questions. So uh, they write, did you write a book about your three year study of being an octogenarian? What were a few of the insights you acquired that have made a difference in your life? And what about becoming 80, do you now dread? Yes, there's a book. It's called Disguised a True Story. Um, what was the second one? Uh, what are a few of the insights you acquired that have made a difference? You will have more dates when you hit 80 than when you're 26. <laughs> um, there's no ceiling on debauchery. Uh, <laughs> um, I knew going in, so I can't really claim I learned it, but it was reinforced that there's nothing to be afraid of, and we live in such a wacky culture where we'll nip it and tuck it and liposuck it and do anything but um, enjoy graceful aging and aging well. Um, I find it very Hitlerian that not just women, but now men are cutting up their bodies into someone else's image of acceptability. Uh, so th that facet of the AMA just loves me. Um, the third one? Third one was, what I, about becoming 80? Well, you? I'm all for it. I'm 60 this year, so I'm really looking forward to 80. Um, here's how I think we help the economy. We need to start really celebrating our birthdays properly. One lousy day is not going to cut it, and I have <laughs> never lived by this principle. So um, in years where you have a zero or a five at the end of your number, you get to celebrate for the entire year. You need to be your own best advocate for this uh, celebration. You have to tell total strangers in line at the grocery store that it's your birthday. I find if you do this to men like Dean and say, you know, it's my birthday, they innocently will say something very cute and quick like, I didn't get you anything. <laughs> <laughs> to wit, you can start bobbing your head towards the peanut M&Ms, and I can honestly tell you I have no shame in accepting candy from strangers. <laughs> um, I think that 
what the baby boom cohort is doing is redefining what it is to be 80. Um, 80 is, is nothing to be afraid of. 80 for me will be so different than for my mom and for my grandmother and my great grandmother. Um, every time I'm on the Ginza, I see women in Japan in their 70s, 80s, and beyond, and they are fashionita, fashionitas. They are just dressed to the nines. They are glorious, and I'm always stopping them in the street and scaring them because I need to know where did they get that coat. Um, so I think that's all the good stuff. And I think exposing ageism, as I hope I did with that piece of work and then what has come since, is yet one more way of, of making sure we all recognize that we are the same. We all have loves and likes and dislikes and fears and pain and agony and angst and joy and rapture. We all want to make a difference. We all want to leave the world a better place. And we're all going to do it in our own unique way. So that's what makes us all the same. Um, what I fight for, of course, is for all of our years to have a lifespan of quality based in equality by design. Wonderful. Inspirational. Kevin, the next one's yours, and I did not write this. This comes from our audience. They wrote, besides graduating wonderful, talented students such as yourself, what advice would you give to RIT and other universities in general to help them augment a much needed innovation in the United States? You know, um, I think that uh, of, 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 uh, of all the universities I've had a, a chance to work with, um, RIT is really, truly, honestly, uniquely uh, uh, positioned to continue to uh, uh, really push innovation. I think, you know, RIT for decades now has really focused on actual hands-on work in every program that you've got. You know, we were looking at the um, Institute for Health Sciences over here today, and uh, um, you know, even the uh, the PA program there is, you know, it's, it's what differentiates that from others is hands on, hands on, hands on. We're going to put your hands on on a cadaver. We're going to put your hands on on something. So, you know, uh, uh, RIT's uh, complete mentality of let's prepare these people for work with actual hands on lab work, and a little less ethereal, and you know, and let's make it more hands on. Um, I think it's really paid off. Now, the, the, and I think that's true in every program here. I think any of us who went here would 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 say that. Um, <clears throat> generally, you get back to uh, cultures. Uh, so, you know, the uh, as Dean said, uh, the United States uh, of America has had almost a you know complete stranglehold on the vast majority of innovation on the planet for about 150 to 200 years, <clears throat> and certainly since we took the Industrial Revolution from, from England in, in, say, the mid-1800s. And with the Industrial Revolution, uh, here came money, came great universities. Remember, before that, the great universities were in Europe, and then they became here. And so we built great universities. Uh, still, the best university system in the world is in the United States, period, bar none. Uh, no question about it. Uh, and our culture was one that inspired innovation. We uh, uh, accepted risk. Risk was good, it was good to take, and we also built an intellectual property system that protected you if you took that risk and it worked out. And all of those things have to work together. A great university system uh, you know, with experiential learning, with, um, uh, with uh, uh, the ability to protect the things that you do and, and uh, with the ability to take risk and, and, and be okay with that risk. Now what we risk in the United States is that other countries have noted that that worked quite well for us. We, we, we had decades and decades and decades of wealth. Now, we continue to live as a country as if we're growing that wealth, although the wealth seemed to stop growing about 15 or 20 years ago. And the wealth is now growing in other nations. And China's economy may surpass ours in the next handful of years, uh, depending on whose numbers you believe. And since they don't float their currency, we don't know which numbers to believe, which is a longer conversation. Uh, the problem in China, real quickly, is as scared as we are of that, and we should be, is that they don't really protect intellectual property in the way we do. They don't uh, have a truly open culture where you can talk about anything you want in the way we do. And, um, th and, you know, and those things are probably required. Um, you, know, you can't close off Twitter and Facebook and say to your population, go innovate. I, you know, there's just something that says, you know, I might get shot if I innovate in the wrong way. I better be a little more careful here. So, 
Um, I suspect in the long run the U.S. Uh, wins this game, and, uh, and it is a game, and it's a game we had better win. Um, but we need to foster innovation through encouraging risk, through encouraging the experiential education like you get at RIT, and, uh, uh, and continuing to have a, a, a world-class intellectual property system that protects the rights of those who invent things and gives them a you know, 17 to 20 year head start on making profits. And there's a reason that that time is 20 years, because it takes 20 years before it's really a big deal. Good. Great. Um, this question is for Mr. Kamen. said, uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Kamen for inventing the life-changing insulin pump, making the lives of diabetics better. Will you please talk about this a bit? So, uh, to reiterate, it takes 20 years to go from indefensible to indispensable. The insulin pump is a perfect example because there's all sorts of myths about how I did that and why we did that and how it came to be. But here's the reality, and you'll see where the 20 years comes in. I have an older brother who's a brilliant guy he leaves high school, he's only three years older than I am, but he's working in med schools and doing crazy stuff. And next time I look, he's getting an MD and a PhD. His PhD is in pharmacology. He's developing drug therapies for babies with really, really bad conditions, different kinds of cancer, particularly his expertise is leukemia. So he's this MD, PhD candidate, and he's doing his residency at a local trade school down in Connecticut called uh, Yale. And uh, he'd come home weekends and whine and complain about the fact that he has some new therapies that he thinks will be fantastic, but these babies that are born, he's a, he's a neonatologist, he's a, he's a hematologist, pediatric guy. Some of these babies are born already pretty frail. They weigh two kilos or less, three or four pounds. And back then, this is pretty tough stuff. And all the equipment in the hospital is made for adults. Not surprisingly, it's market driven. Most of the people that get really sick that spend a lot of time in a hospital are adults. In fact, they're older adults. They don't have a big enough market to make custom special ways to give the right amount of a drug to a baby whose entire vascular system is, you know, a couple of tablespoons, right? So after listening to him complain about the fact that they don't make stuff that will deliver very, very small amounts, which aren't small relative to a baby. I said, well, instead of putting the drug in the syringe and then sticking it in the IV bag, why don't you leave it in the syringe, a tiny syringe, put it into some little device and just deliver it directly? And that's a good idea. But he's a doc, right? So I get down in the basement and start building him stuff. And I, this is before the FDA had control of medical devices. <laughs> um, you, you can laugh, but if they did, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. Um, I would make these things up, and he would snap a syringe in, and I would calibrate it, and it was the early days of CMOS processes, so I could, it's the intersection of good, low power electronics. It didn't have microprocessors, I was doing it with CMOS, mm -hmm. TTL. Mm -hmm. And I'd make these little devices, and he'd take it and use it and do his research. Well, it turns out that that's not a really good business for a couple of reasons. A, it's a very small market, neonatology. And I hope it stays that way. I hope no more babies ever need this stuff. And B, brothers are really crummy customers. They don't pay you anything. <laughs> so, so I'm making this stuff for him on the side, trying to run my little business to, among other things, be able to go make more of this stuff for my brother. One day, I get a call from an adult doc at Yale. My brother was very proud of the stuff I gave him. And he had been using it for some, some of the adults were borrowing these things to give adults outpatient chemotherapy, because that's my brother's peers are. And what I found staggering, again, I'm a young kid at the time, and wow, people with cancer, that's a serious thing. After they were getting way better therapies by wearing this thing, my brother would come back and say, well, the docs were using it. And they were bigger than our insulin pumps, but they were maybe the size of a butter dish. 
they'd come back and say they used it for a few weeks and stopped. The patient compliance wasn't very good, even though you need this chemotherapy, hopefully to cure you, or you've got a life-threatening disease. So I certainly didn't go into the business. In fact, any feedback we were getting, quote, from the real market was, people aren't willing to wear this thing, even for the full few months of getting chemo. So another one of his professor types calls me. I'm still working in my parents' basement down in Long Island. And my brother actually gave me a heads up and says, hey, this guy wants to use it for something else. You got to come up here and talk to him. So I borrow my parents' car, you know, drive to Yale, go visit this guy. He's an endocrinologist. And he says, you know, that little pump that sits in the isolate that you made for your brother, it's pretty small. It's small enough that we could put it on somebody and they could walk around with it for nine months. Back to your story about the difference between how tough women are and not so much. Anyway, <laughs> this guy finishes explaining to me that, you see, there are a lot of diabetics in the country, lots, sadly, millions. But they learn to live with it. And yeah, their average blood sugar goes up pretty high, but they accommodate that. There's a lot of long-term bad effects of that. Retinopathy, porphyria disease, microangiography, they lose limbs. I mean, over the years, having enough control of your insulin, of your blood glucose, that you're not in a coma, but not enough to keep you well-regulated, says that over the lifetime you're going to have these bad effects. And everybody knew that, by the way. Everybody knew that. But he says, the problem is a young woman who's a diabetic is carrying a baby, and after a few months the baby has now developed a pancreas. That pancreas wants that baby's blood glucose to be 110 milligrams per deciliter, just like everybody else. But it's got this little tiny pancreas, and through that umbilical, this mother is, there is so much blood going through that baby, it can't keep up. Mm. So they end up with what are called macrosomes, and the babies get to look like a little Buddha after a second trimester. And typically they wouldn't go to term, and typically it's a problem. So this doc explains to me, but if we could put this pump on, and we could keep the blood glucose under really tight control instead of giving them one shot in the morning and one shot at night. They'll have full-term babies and they'll be healthy and everything will be good. Great, I can modify the control so you can hit it and give a bolus. I can modify it so it's calibrated in units of insulin. It didn't take much engineering to modify my chemo pump, which is, again, my bad business because brothers don't pay, to an even worse business, which as I explained to this guy, because by then I'm an expert. I said, hey doc, you need to know something. I'll modify some of these pumps for you. You seem like a good researcher. Besides, my brother's proud of this, and he's a student here. I'll give you your pumps. But uh, these women will never wear it for the nine months. I mean, people that are going to die if they don't get their chemo don't even remain compliant. I figured I was giving him great insight, good marketing, right? I'm not a marketer. This doc looks at me, and he laughs. He said, Dean, I don't think you understand. I believe most patients are uncompliant even if their life is on the line. But you show me a woman that wants to have a healthy baby, she'll wear a refrigerator for nine months. <laughs> don't worry about it. So he was so convincing, I went home and built him a whole bunch of these little pumps for the very specific purpose of letting him do research to prove that if you had tight glucose control, these women would have full-term healthy babies. Well, it turns out you don't have to wait the 20 or 30 years to see all the other bad side effects that most docs knew about that are serious in diabetics. Here was a digital outcome. You put a dozen of these things on pregnant women, and either they're going to have a, a full-term healthy baby or not, even though they have diabetes. And sure enough, they did. He publishes on this subject, and of course, uh, there's a lot of excitement. So much so that I actually started a little business building these pumps. Here's the rub, everybody. Depending on whose numbers you believe, and I'm sure they're inflated by those people that want them inflated. If you take diabetes, which by itself is one of the most common chronic conditions of anybody in this country, there's 22 million type 2s, there's a couple of million type 1s, it's the fastest growing. But even back in the 80s when we were starting to do this, which we stumbled into because I was helping my brother's professor on a very specific thing, pregnant women, it's well known that over the lifetime of just that one or two shots a day, 
the probability of end-stage renal failure, needing one of our dialysis machines, is 17 times higher if you've been a diabetic your whole life. Cardiac failure, blindness, you add up all the effects that are so expensive to treat chronically to such a large population, and there's some credible data that says treating diabetes and all of its effects is as high as 30% of healthcare costs in the United States. So now, back to that, it takes 20 years to make inventions, that's what the little pump was, into an innovation. From the day they published that first research paper at a Yale, a credible institution, with data on these women that had these healthy babies, it was more than 20 years before most insurance companies would pay to let hmm. diabetic patients wear pumps because the short-term cost of the pump was something they were fighting against, but they're gonna pay to take care of these people with these horrible conditions for a lifetime. So, innovation is not for the faint of heart, people. Get the invention right, buckle your seatbelt, and keep working at it. And in about 20 years, you'll have an instant overnight success. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. What wonderful takeaways we've had today. I, I, uh, I've just been um, awed at the uh, insights, at the stories of how these uh, very unique individuals have uh, carved their lives and, and in, the, in doing so helped millions of people. Uh, you might all have your takeaways. Uh, uh, I heard uh, teach and take risks. I heard let's get past the language and, and uh, give people the hope of innovation uh, to, to make their lives better. Uh, but clearly the, the one takeaway that um, I think we all should be um, uh, having is that there, there apparently is great opportunities for innovation in the collection of bodily waste. So uh, I, I think our students will have lots of projects uh, for uh, their senior capstone experiences moving them. Let's give a, a very warm and hearty welcome and a, a thank you for their, our panelists today. And Dean and Kevin and Patty, uh, we are so proud to have uh, you as alums or as a connection to RIT. You um, really make us quite proud of uh, all the things that you've accomplished and all these great words today. So again, thank you and we uh, look forward to celebrating your induction into the RIT Innovation Hall of Fame later tonight. Thanks again, everyone. <laughs>